sometimes sometimes in in ministry we focus so much on the things that are happening to those in our congregation or um, maybe things that are that are that are happening around us that we kind of forget to take care of ourselves now let me kind of clarify that because it sounds like I'm saying you know you know I need to watch out for me or no one else is going to and that's not what I'm saying at all um, but sometimes we focus so much on where we're needed that we forget that we too are in need let me say it like that um, I heard someone say once and I don't remember where um, I think it was in one of Mark Middleberg's books, but I'm not sure. Um, he said, uh, or somebody said, um, we are all beggars. The only thing is we're telling where, where the bread is to the other beggars. Uh, and I think that that really applies to this as well. Um, you know, sometimes we get so caught up in helping other people and taking care of other people's problems, we just kind of forget to still do those things we've been called to do. If you're a husband... You're called to be a husband. If if you have kids, your kids are your first first missions field. They come, they they need to come first. God gave you children to, to to teach and to raise up. And sometimes we just get so caught up into the bad things that are happening around us. Um. So really, I'm I'm gonna be talking about a, a lot more about leadership uh, in the church. I really feel like that's a that's a, the right direction for me to go. But before I get into that stuff, I, I want to talk about this. Um, pastors who are without hope. Um, you know, I, I've seen a lot of pastors who are basically the unsung heroes of their community. You know, they're they're up late at night, they're up early in the morning, taking care of people, oftentimes without without a thank you. You know, um, they, they 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 work really hard at their sermons and stuff, and and then you know, um, it, it's really hard when Monday comes around and. Uh, instead of you know hearing anything encouraging, you just hear a bunch of people complaining about something. That can be can get very very discouraging. Um, but for that, I, I do want to encourage you before we get into this. <sighs> Leadership trickles down. If you want a congregation that is humble, be humble. If you want a congregation that that seeks after the Lord, you have to seek after the Lord. If you want a congregation that perseveres in prayer, persevere in prayer. And in everything that happens, always compare compare what's going on to Christ. Don't get your eyes caught on the situation. What did Christ do when his family rejected him? What did Christ do when his own people rejected him? See, what did Christ do in these circumstances? What did Christ do when he was faced with temptation? What did Christ do in these situations? And I think that um, a lot of wisdom can be found in that. But I want to encourage you, don't don't give up. Just stop for a second and, and, and think about that. Don't give up. Okay? Um, it, it, it may seem like a funny thing that, you know, pastors don't struggle with depression, but actually it is quite common. And if you feel this, you're, you're really not alone. Um, depression in God's service is actually a surprisingly common thing. Um, and there are many different factors, uh, but I do want to make known a book. This book, this version that I called, that I have, is called "Restoring Your Spiritual Passion," but um, the American release, I think, is called "Renewing Your Spiritual Passion." It's by a guy named Gordon McDonald. Where, if you know anything about him, you know he was, you know, got into some um, immorality there. And I really think that this book um, shows a lot of experience. Some people have, have misunderstood what he's saying and, and thought, oh, well, he's just saying, you know, you need to separate yourself from certain bad people. That's not what he's saying at all. If you read the whole thing, it's pretty clear what he's saying. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what he says in this. Um, but again, depression is not uncommon. There are a lot of pastors who struggle with burnout. You go somewhere with all these hopes and dreams and you have all these plans and then they just get, they just get, they just fall apart. Um, there, in, 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 I think it's um, called Chechnya. There was this, you know, the radiation leaks and all that with the nuclear stuff. Um, you know, even after contaminants are removed, 
the problem still remains for a number of years, and it's the exact same way. Maybe something happened before you even became a pastor, but it takes a while for that radiation poisoning to clear out. If there is a pastor before you who, who got into immorality or anything like that, there's going to be some, something left over. If the pastor before you was prideful, if the pastor before you talked bad about the pastor before him, and you'll always have some people in your congregation who are always on the quest of the church the way it used to be. But that church is gone. And it'll be something that you struggle with within yourself. God desires a new thing, a new way to lead you. Don't get lost with hopelessness because it'll completely your church will drift into nothingness. Forgive those people who are causing problems and move on. You don't want to become a pastor who's bitter, who's always thinking about the way that everybody else has wronged them, who no longer has an effect on their community. Seriously stop and analyze and look, am I having still having an impact on my community? Am I still relevant to my community or have I become obsolete because I'm teaching to people who no longer exist? We need to make sure that we're not answering questions that aren't being answered. I mean, answering questions that aren't being asked. So if you are struggling with depression, um, really stay in there. Um, everybody has or will or is. Everybody is somewhere on, the, on that scale who's in ministry. And this is unscripted. I don't have any prepared notes. I just um, wrote down a few ideas, um, and, and I'm just going to kind of wing this. Um, but uh, let me get on this. Okay, there we go. Um, so, you know, it... It, burnout is basically, without getting too much into it, is basically the loss of passion. Um, where you just maybe you don't care, maybe you want to care, but you really don't. Maybe you're um, just weighed down with with, with with sorrow. Maybe you just um, just tired. You just want to maybe give up. Um, this is called burnout. Um, very closely related with depression. They oftentimes go go hand in hand. Um, and once again, don't feel like you're the oddball. Many pastors deal with this. Many pastors deal with this. I just I just don't know what happened. I, I don't feel like I can keep on going. I don't want to keep on going. You're not alone. <laughs> you are not alone. Um, and there is definitely a battle all around you every day. And we'll talk about it in just a second. First off, you won't see the effects of all you do. The good things that you do and the bad things that you do will impact those who come later. But you won't see all of it. Think of the prophet Jeremiah, who prophesied to a nation who didn't care. But in his suffering, many generations of God's people have become strengthened. In his suffering, many Christians have grown. In his suffering, the promises of God were relayed to more people. And remember that. It's not necessarily about the end result. If everybody actually learns something in this moment. Sometimes it just matters that you're obeying God. And in that, there's a certain calm quiet that can be found. A certain blessing and encouragement that can be found in that. So you won't see the effects of all you do. And that's something that, that you do need to realize. You know, we come to a church and we have just so, such high hopes. Such high hopes. And then we try to change everything all at once because we see the things that are wrong. But then throughout the course of time, with opposition, with these different things that happen, we just kind of start to flatline. Oh, I'll try to remember to talk about making changes, but that's for another. In fact, I'm writing it down right now, making changes. We'll talk about that probably in the next lesson. But for this... Um, realize that. You won't see the effects of all you do. David never got to see the temple being built that his son would finish. He got stuff in, in, in preparation, but he never got to see it finished. And it's the same thing with, with pastoring and with doing, serve, doing ministry. We're constantly laying down foundations of either good things or bad things, blessings or curses, positive or negative. We're always laying down laying down a foundation for those who follow after us, for our kids, for our spouses, for, for our congregation. And you won't always see the effects of that. You are needed even if you don't see it. Sometimes we get this almost like a pity party. 
Nobody likes me. I just I don't even know why I'm here. I, I don't I don't know. I'm not doing any good. I'm not doing anyone any good any good. But the truth is that you are needed. I think it's in the book of Ezekiel. Um, God says, I was looking for someone to stand in the gap. And I couldn't find anyone. You know, sometimes people don't see the good that you're doing. I remember seeing a picture um, from World War II. And there were all these people giving the, um, I forget what it's called, but the um, the thing that they did for, for, for um, Hitler. Um, ugh, I can't believe I don't remember this. Uh, but anyways, and there's this one person in the crowd who wasn't. He just had his hands like this. You know, sometimes when we're surrounded by things going on around us, we don't see what's going on. And we just get kind of weighed down because we don't have God's eyes. And we just kind of forget where we're going, forget w what our purpose is. We just drift. We're just there. And then we start feeling like we're just there. You know, and sometimes you need a break. Sometimes you're doing something wrong. But regardless, you are needed, even if you don't see it. Try changing your tactics. Um, you know, do, do and start analyzing the con the con the community around you and see what do they need and how can we meet those needs. Maybe a food pantry, um, maybe uh, special classes, maybe you know whatever. Um, re renew that vision. You are needed, even if you don't see it. Um, you know, I, I can't help but wonder in, in the book of Daniel if if Daniel if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had not had not decided to stand up for God, even though nobody really would have known, what would have happened differently? King Nebuchadnezzar maybe would have never repented of his wickedness, potentially. You know, I don't think that they saw that outcome. They just knew what they knew was right and what they knew was wrong. So really, you are needed even if you don't see it. I I, I, I was going through this for, for all, all, over a year, and then I went on vacation. I just got away from it all. And I, start, I spent every day on this vacation, rather than just zoning out, I spent every single day um, getting in the Word and praying. And, you know, I came to a certain place of, of just, it'll be okay. Sometimes we stress ourselves out with things that we don't even need to do. You know, what we think that we do. And that's the case for me. Um, and I, you know, nobody likes me and everything. But then when I came back, I realized, you know, I'm getting stressed out and bent out of shape on these things. You know, we get so impatient. All this has to be done right now. No, just be patient and wait on the Lord. And do the things that he has already placed at your hand. Just take a step back and relax. It's not it, It's not a big deal. Just, you know, it, it's hard to remember that when we're dealing with people who are, you know, struggling with drugs, struggling in porn, their marriages are falling apart, everything's, you know, going crazy. And we think that we just have this idea that if we're not there to hold it together for, for every second of every day, everything is just going to fall apart. And I, I do want to encourage you at this point, we'll talk about this more later. But um, get some leadership aids. Get people who will come alongside you and help you. People you can actually depend on. Um, there doesn't need to be power struggles between you and the board or, or between you and the elders or deacons or whatever you have at your church. There does need to be some big power struggle. And we'll talk about that later. Should I just get rid of my board? We'll talk about that later. Um, but um, for now, I just want to focus on be patient in the perseverance. And, and be patient in your persecution is what I meant to say. Um, and, and don't make any rash decisions. Just be patient and pray. Just be patient and patient and pray. James says that the, that the prayer of a righteous person avails much. It, it does how it does do something. Okay, be, not because the prayer is some magical holcomb, but because God hears our prayers. Um, and, you know, as Peter mentioned in his epistle, it's better to suffer for doing the right thing than suffer for doing the wrong thing. So regardless of, of what you feel, you are needed. You are very much needed. Even if everyone in the community is opposing you at this place and at this current time, you are still needed. Um, but then don't forget that God sees your, 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 your suffering. He sees what's going on, 
It doesn't. It didn't catch him off off guard. He knew this was going to happen. Okay. And sometimes there are no easy answers. Um, a friend of mine lost his baby. Um, you know, the 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 uh, pregnancy was fine. The the labor was fine. Um, just a very sudden thing. And uh, it, it becomes very easy to say, you know, well, why why did you let this happen, God? You know, God doesn't necessarily answer those questions. In the book of Job, Job's going through all these things, and, and, he, and he asks, why is this happening? And I don't think that God ever asks him. I, maybe I'm, I mean, answering him. Answers. I don't think God ever answers him. Um, I, I haven't studied Job in a while, but as I recall, I don't think that God ever answers Job. This is why you suffered. I think that God used it to show some, some pride in Job. But I don't think that, that, that Job ever found out why. And, you know, and sometimes when we ask why, just stop and think. Do you really want to know why? Or are you speaking out of hurt? You know, because if you're speaking out of hurt, seeking the Lord is the right thing to do. Um, so for this, you know, I used, to, I used to say this all the time, but only in going through recent struggles have I realized how true this actually is. Strengthen yourself in prayer. Seek the Lord, and don't just sit there and do your routine. Don't just sit there and go through the motions. I mean, actually seek the Lord. Um, remember back how you used to. Remember how you used to seek after the Lord, and you, you, you actually felt like you were going somewhere? Try to remember that. What changed? What changed is you got your eyes off of God and onto the situation, and you stopped seeking Him as fervently as you used to. You will go through these dry patches, but remember that there is hope on the other side. Um, so strengthen yourself in prayer. Because um, God definitely does see your suffering. You know, um, sometimes we get caught up in the prosperity theology. You know, God works all things for good, so that means, you know, everything's going to be good. Don't get caught up in these kinds of things. Just patiently wait for the Lord's, for the Lord's, um, um, release, I guess you could say. I read through James, you know, and they're going through all these, all these things with their, with these landlords uh, who are taking advantage of them. And what does James tell them? You be patient then. Be patient. He didn't say, you know, um, do this. And he says, and also don't grumble against each other. Just be patient. Um, don't forget that God is strong past us. Past what we are, God is strong. If we're standing in our own strength, prepare to be humbled. If you're standing in pride, prepare to be humbled. Ministry is a humbling thing. You have to constantly think about what's best for other people. You have to serve other people all the time. Um, you have to put other people first. That's not easy. You know, um, but if you stick it out, God can accomplish something. I heard it said once that a pastor doesn't even reach his full potential until he's at a church for over seven years. Sometimes we come to a problem church and we try to solve all the problems, and sometimes we accidentally create a problem church. And some sometimes things just become a problem that we didn't even necessarily have anything to do, but regard and do with. But regardless of what where where it came from, you stick it out. King Saul was supposed to have dealt with some of the problems, but he failed, and so as a result, King David had to. It wasn't. It shouldn't have been his problem. He inherited a problem, but it still was his problem. So what did he do? He sought the Lord and said, "Should I should I go and attack the Philistines? Will we win? Is this what we should do?" And what did God tell him? The second time, I want you to go around and wait for the sound in the trees and then go. So just think about that. I mean, he was he was king, called by God, and yet he still waited on God. You are a pastor, called by God, not here by accident. Wait on God. Don't grow impatient in your suffering. Don't throw it all away. Just keep sticking it out. You can make it. Um, even if you're struggling with the worst case of burnout, you can make it. You can make it. God is strong past what we are. And take, take breaks. You know, how many, I, I, in this book, he talks about how many breaks do, does God take during creation? And people say, well, one. Well, no, actually there were seven. God created, then he stopped and saw. He created, then he stopped and saw. When he was doing stuff, he, he, took, he took time to look at what he had done. How does this apply to us? Take times to evaluate what you're doing as a leader. Are you still on target? Are you still going somewhere? Are you still doing the right thing? Take breaks. You don't always have to be doing. you know. And then also, Sunday is obviously not your time off. 
I mean, find a day that you can that you can take off, or, or even two works really great. And go do something fun. Take your family to the park or something, or the zoo. Just do anything that's that's fun. Um, and taking breaks is something that needs to happen um, on a weekly basis, but then also vacations are necessary too. Vacations are very necessary. Um, oh, I can't leave right now because of the situation with with the board or with with um, with this problem person in the church. That's why we raise up leaders um, to do those kinds of things. If you're in a place where you can't take off right now, um, you don't have to take off very long, and you don't have to publicize the fact that you're leaving. Just one morning, uh, load your family up and go up to go up to a, a nearby campground and uh, stay the night, and then be back, you know, the next day in the evening. You know, it, it doesn't have to be long or, or real dramatic, or if you don't have the money to do it, it doesn't have to be real expensive. You know, find a way to do it. Um, I would encourage you, if you at all can, do not work a second job while pastoring because pastoring is a full-time job. So obviously that's a little bit overworking yourself. Um, and if you're considering going into such a situation, it's very difficult. I would highly discourage it. Pa pastoring requires all your time, all of it. Um, and you can't sacrifice your time if you're working a second job. So that needs to be, you know, noted. Um, but, you know, for what if I'm in that situation and I can't get out? Well, I would encourage you to stay the course and pray, but uh, make sure that you do take those little vacations. I mean, my wife one time I set up a tent in the living room, and um, it was very fun. It was very relaxing. I mean, these are, these are, that didn't cost us anything. So, uh, anyways, um... Who are you hanging around? He lists a great list of people. Now, as a pastor, you really can't say, I'm not, I'm not going to witness to these people. You have to witness to everybody. However, remember that a pastor is not there for entertainment. See, in today's American culture, we have this idea that a pastor needs to be judged and critiqued, that he needs to... No, no, no. A pastor's job is to raise the people up for ministry. However, in that, there's certain people that you will find. There are, there are the, 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 the negative people, the people who complain about everything. They're always gossiping. They're always causing problems. And yet, as someone said, I, I can't remember which book it was in, but he said, yet they can never find it in themselves to leave. I don't know. They're, they're never satisfied with the job that you do, but, the, but they're, always, they're always telling you how, how poorly you're doing it. There are those people. But then there's the people called the soakers. I think he calls it the, the people who just sop up the milk. They're, they're, the, they're the people who just sit in the cereal and they're enjoying it. You know, they're, they're the cereal that just sits there in the milk and, 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 and gets all soggy, but they don't really do anything to the flavor. They just they just kind of soak there. They enjoy and they enjoy being uh, being at the church. They enjoy what's going on, but they don't necessarily want to do anything or contribute. They don't actually want to be a disciple or disciple others. You know, and then there's the people who mentor you. The people who pour into you. But then there's the people that you pour into. This would be like Paul and Timothy. But then there's the people who just come alongside you. Who are you hanging around with on your free time? Are you hanging around with people that you can actually call friend? Someone who you're not threatened by? Someone who you can simply serve alongside or that you can pour into or, or who pours into you obviously we don't need to be chasing around good feelings you don't need to be chasing around people who will pour into you especially if you're the pastor however um when you spend all your time around those negative people you start thinking that they are the only people there but the truth is there are a lot of other people they're usually just a small small minority um but, you know, obviously God will direct you through prayer as to what the course of action should be for your future. With that being said, you know, make sure that you're hanging around people who, who, um, who you can call friend. Um, I think that that's, that's pretty sufficient. Just, you know, I'm not saying, once again, I'm not saying that as a pastor you can pick and choose who you serve. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that certain people add to us. And some people take away from us. Just throwing it out there. Um, you know, and denying reality doesn't make it any less real. 
oh well well that's that's just not a good idea that's just not a good view to have well it doesn't make it any less true there are people who will negatively impact you they will constantly drain you then there are those people who will build you up and then there's those people who just are kind of there you know a disciple always learns and a disciple teaches other people who will learn but also remember why you did it. Why did you get in the, in the ministry in the, in the first place? Why did you come here? Don't forget that. Don't ever forget that. Um, you know, sometimes we just lose our, our, our vision and we just kind of are. We're not doing anything. The church isn't doing anything. We're not witnessing to people. We're not training people. We're not even teaching or preaching about anything that's, that, that's applicable to anybody's real world life. We're not, we're not giving them any application. We're just teaching pointless doctrine just for the sake of pointless doctrine. Not that theology is bad or misplaced, but when theology is only told for the sake of theology being told without any any uh, um, application to, to, to what the congregation is going through, it's pointless. It's pointless. Honestly, ask yourself this. What good does it, does it, does it do to if your church knows that – knows um, – knows about the Trinity, unless it is for something to encourage their behavior. Paul constantly contra contrasts beliefs with 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 with, um, with lifestyle. You know, he, he talks about bad people who are who are teaching bad things, but for the purpose of saying their lifestyle is doing this. See, with the things that we do, I mean, believe leads us to what we do. So remember why you do it. Don't just teach things. Make sure that make sure that you're actually fulfilling the goal that you had when you set out. It's good to know about the Trinity because we need to know the God that we serve. But if they don't realize that, and they're just thinking, okay, that I need to mem memorize this so it's so I can answer the the check mark on the test. What good does that do them? We need to get them into a personal relationship with the Lord. Not everybody. People aren't going. People don't have full understanding of God, anyways. It's more important that they know God. So you see what I'm saying? I hope you. I hope you get what I'm saying here. Remember why you did it: to seek and to save that which was lost. A Christian is known by their by their deeds, and we are raising up Christians. We are raising up disciples. Remember why you did it. And not only that, but realize this. If you leave up, just up and leave, you, you can choose whether or not to take a ministry position somewhere. But once you decide to leave before you've accomplished what God called you to do there, it will be worse than if you never came. I will say that. There's a warning there. But also, don't forget that you know there are people who you will impact. Good days to come that you'll never know because you gave up. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Focus on the good things that have happened, the good things that are still happening. I think it was Rick Warren who once who said, you know, usually it's not like this. Usually there's ba really bad things happening and really good things happening at the same time. So don't just focus on the bad. Focus on the good. Get direction. Get vision. Remember why you're there. Remember why you're there. And, you know, you may have to uh, adjust what your church does. You may have to get rid of some pointless some pointless things. We have a Sunday school, and there's one person who comes. And, yeah. I would say that something is wrong. You're not impacting someone. Maybe it's too early. Maybe the teacher, I mean, you don't want to belittle your teacher and you don't want to, you know, that kind of thing, but maybe your teacher isn't really on the same page as you as to where the direction is. Um, you know, maybe it's the worship. Um, you know, people, service isn't to please people, of course. However, that doesn't mean that you need to get someone with the world's worst voice. It just, it'll just push people away. You want to, you want to try and get people in. Not to say that you have to, um, you know, become so lost in the world, but remember that People are the ones who are worshiping, and you need to have something where people can worship. Sometimes worship leaders are just a distraction. You know, fog lights and lights and all these, or fog, uh, 
fog machines and, and the lights and everything, is it distracting from the Lord or is it actually drawing people into communion? It doesn't matter how good or how bad your worship leader is, do they have a heart after the Lord? Talent doesn't matter. It's about the heart. And it's the same thing with you. You can literally be the world's best speaker. You can know everything. But if your heart isn't in the right place, there, there's no point. Your talent doesn't doesn't make doesn't make it good. I do want to encourage you in that. You know, um, why are not people not coming to my services? Are you ever getting out of your office? Are you spending all your time in your office? Or are you spending time with people? Are all your are, are all your church's ministries focused on maintenance or on discipleship and growth? When all you have in your church is just ministries to maintain. We don't have a Sunday night service. We only have a Sunday morning. We don't have um, we only have a midweek service, and we, we're not really talking about anything important. We're just kind of talking about this, that, or the other thing. Remember why you're there. Remember why you're there. Sometimes we get ourselves into into situations that cause burnout. Sometimes we hang around people who cause burnout. Sometimes we just keep going until we're burnt out. Sometimes we're given a situation that we just need to step back from. You know, these are these are real the real things that happen around us, and denying it won't change anything. Um, there, we, I'll have more leadership um, lessons in the future, more focus. This one was just kind of my thoughts. I'm just kind of brainstorming as I go. But just don't don't forget these things that I said. You won't see the effects of all you do. You are needed even if you don't see it. God knows you're suffering and he is there to strengthen you. Um, you need to take breaks. You need to watch who you're spending who you're spending time with if you're spending time with anyone. Sometimes we get so drained from ministry we don't spend time with anybody who encourages us. So hook up with other pastors in your community. Hook up with anyone else. You know, just try to obviously stay away from the opposite sex. Have a date now with your wife. I mean, goodness sakes, figure out something. Um, and then remember why you did it and focus on the good. Um, but burnout is very real. Um, and, there, you know, depression is something that you're going to go and go through. Um, I hope that you don't have any questions. If you do, I'm sorry, I hope that I answered questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, and I'll, I'll get back as soon as I can.